Welcome back to Editor's Roundtable. As earnings season kicks off, what can investors expect from Q3 earnings? Nimesh, are you looking at more EPS downgrades and what light can you shed on this? So, you know, I've looked at the earnings, what to expect in quarter three. We've already seen some IT companies reporting and the, and the, and the broad line is that the top line is good, but there is a hit on the margin. So, looks like that's going to be the big theme in the quarter three earnings across the board. So, the big picture is the, uh, it's, uh, expect a muted earnings. So, no big, big surprises there. Post quarter three earnings, you can expect a 4 to 6 percent EPS cut for FY23. That's the consensus across most of the brokerages. Now, where the earnings cut will come in, it will come in, uh, it will come in energy, materials and con consumer discretionary. Whereas uh, you will see a positive surprise in the financials, but to some extent, that's in the price. It's going to be margin pressure across the sector. That's the overall feedback from, uh, from most of the brokerages. Now, I've looked at the sectoral uh, you know, trends as well, what to expect in various sectors. I'll start with autos first. In autos, expect a, a, you know, a bit of a gross margin improvement because of the cooling commodity prices. So that's something for autos. For capital goods, the order book will be most important to track in quarter, in quarter three. For cement, that's going to be interesting because for cement, the expectation is there is going to be some improvement quarter and quarter in terms of EBITDA pattern. So that's something to watch out for as far as cement is concerned. For, uh, for the discretionary and retail, uh, the, the commentary on demand slowdown will be very important to track in terms of earnings. For financials, that's going to be very important. You'll, you're going to see a very strong credit growth plus the name expansion as well. So that's going to be a double uh, benefit for the financial sector. For pharma, a decent sort of uh, domestic demand. And for telecom, a very small ARPO growth is what uh, most of the properties are expecting. I I'm also looking at some of the individual stocks. There was a city note on, on expectations from quarter three, and they've put out some uh, stocks which will be positive and negative surprises. In terms of positive surprises in quarter three, Ambuja Cement, SBI Life, Ashok Leland, uh, LNT, and Cipla. These are the stocks which can surprise positively in terms of earnings. And in terms of negative surprises, Tata Steel, TBS Motors, Page Industries, Adani Port, United Spirits. These are the few stocks where city expects a negative surprise in the quarterly earnings. So the net net, the, the, the big picture is expected 3 to 4 percent or 4 to 6 percent EPS cut in FY23 post quarter 3 earnings. Okay. All right. Okay. okay all right. Uh, well, thanks for that, Namesh. Well, Ajay, uh, you know, this market has moving been moving high and we have been the big outperformer because, because we are going to get the best earnings growth. Now, that suddenly seems to be in a bit of doubt, right? Because earlier we were talking about mid-teens growth for two years, easy peasy. Suddenly, that's going to be in well, doubt, right? What's your take on that? Well, well, you have simple. If you have inflation at 20% again, you'll grow at 22%. It's as simple as that. So <clears throat> I think people who mistook inflationary growth, which has happened in the bank uh, portfolio as well, to be the real growth, need to do the calculation at the end of the day that how much of it has come from the uh, inflation and how much it has come from the genuine industrial growth. There is, you can't have a thesis that, India will grow at 6% and this this six month will grow at 4.5%, but banks will grow at 18%. Banks can grow at 18% only, and, and margin can grow at 18% if inflation is above 10%. And if the target of inflation is 5%, then there is no way the economy and the banking system, for instance, and the people under the bank can grow by more than 10%. It's arithmetical. It's nothing exotic about it. Yes, there will be outliers. There will be outlier companies, and that's the beauty of every market, and you get paid for it, is to identify those outliers who will restructure the industry, who will score over the mark, people, etc. The, the problem here is it's not the margin. The problem here is not the expectation. The problem is we're starting off a base of over-enthusiastic mass of retail investors who are pumping in money in the market. Now, their hope is somebody's going to buy on a P expansion mode because you, everybody knows... You know, you can't go much beyond the economy, maybe double the economy. If you double the economy, it's 12% growth. But your P's are running at 30s and 40s and 50s and thereabouts. Now, how does that portfolio make it grow? That's the challenge here. So your challenge in India is large bunch of retail investors hoping against hope that their returns will be exceed the fixed income, which it is not happening. Now, when will they realize it? We don't know. But right now, the mood is very simple. Pick your, your companies very carefully. Are you feeling lucky on the day you pick your company? Please focus on them. Don't look at astrology chart. I didn't mean lucky that way. <laughs> Analyze them deep to see that these companies can grow well in spite of a low growth economy trajectory. And, you know, and we have to have the honesty to look at the fact that 80 crore Indians as a population need food grains to survive. So Indian economy is really worth about 20, 30 crore people. Uh, headlines saying Mercedes-Benz sells highest cars ever in the history does not make the economy. So therefore, prudent selection, I think, is the answer here. And, uh, you know, you've got to be realistic as to what you're doing. And if you bought at high fees, 
Well, you can average and keep averaging. <laughs> okay, I thought you were going to end on an optimistic note. That's a rather somber note that you're ending the discussion on. It's the weekend. Come on, you can lighten up a little bit. No, no, I can light you up by telling you the beautiful thing is that please, and I've been saying this, spend your money. That's yeah. more important. Spend it on your parents, spend it on yourself, spend it on your wife. Be in the good box of everybody yeah. around. Because in this economy, <laughs> at inflation at 7 8%, you're really not saving anything. You're worthwhile buying stuff and enjoying it. And that's been a mantra saying, forget all this investment. It gives you grief at the end of the day, right? You put your money, save, put it there, and yes. don't make okay. a return. Can you imagine? Right. It's bad. <laughs> Ajay, thank you for that wisdom. You're welcome. <laughs> Much needed now, especially post-COVID, right? That's how people have changed. Just go out there and have fun. Thanks a lot for joining in. But now we're going to start talking about the budget. And then once again, all the chatter will be on capital gains tax. So Prashant has put some data together. Prashant, is it all noise? I mean, uh, on, on some uh, aspects it is, uh, and let me tell you why. So this is not a, you know, budget 2023, what to watch out for. Rather, this piece is about budget 2023, what not to watch out for. And that's basically the capital gains taxation regime. Uh, you know, already you're starting to hear this like clockwork. Every budget, I think the one thing which happens is uh, the, the rumor mill starts working over time. And people start talking about how there will be changes to this tax rate, that tax rate, especially on the capital gains tax side. Now, what, what we're saying is it's best to just ignore all of this because no one knows. And I'll tell you why. Where did this kind of uh, uh, rumor mongering in that sense start from, right? Uh, it started from an interview that the former revenue secretary gave CNBC TV 18 on the, uh, in November, 29th of November. He spoke with my colleague Shireen Ban and uh, he, uh, he spoke about this the subject. And what did he say? Uh, he said, uh, you know, we, have done, we had done some preparation. Now it will depend on policymakers. Some preparation on, of course, re uh, reviewing the capital gains tax regime. He said, one thing is for sure that our capital gains tax regime is very complicated and it needs simplification. We have buckets, we have, uh, you know, different uh, time periods, we have different taxation rates, and all of this needs cleaning up. And he ended by saying, the time to do it maybe was yesterday. We will find out on the 1st of February. That interview, I think, sparked off this debate. This is the revenue secretary at that point saying this, that maybe we will hear something this time around. But he also made it clear it's up to the policymakers. He's not involved in the policy, in the budget making, so it's up to them and uh, we can find out. Now, I'm not saying that nothing is going to happen. Something can happen, most definitely. All I'm saying is, uh, you know, this, this, this rumor comes back every time. People talk about it. Uh, sometimes markets are gripped by fear. Uh, there is actual selling which takes place. And we only uh, come back and find out on the 1st of Feb if something has happened or not. Let me just quickly put out the lay of the land in terms of why this capital gains tax regime is so complicated, right? This is uh, all these columns. This is the instrument. So equities, listed stocks, international equity funds, unlisted equity. This is the short-term capital gains tax. So, for example, uh, listed equity short-term is 15%. The slab rate, of course, is whatever income tax slab you fall under. This is the long-term capital gains tax, different, of course. Uh, and then this is the holding period, which makes you eligible for the uh, for avail, uh, availment of the long-term capital gains tax benefit, right? So again, this is different. And this is what Mr. Bajaj was talking about with respect to uh, the different slabs and all of the complication, really. And I'm not even mentioning all. I'm just mentioning, I think, about eight or nine instruments, listed bonds, real estate, gold, ETF, etc. I think are the others where you can see, I mean, there are different changes. And it really needs a tax expert if you want uh, to kind of simplify all of this, even to file your uh, return in some cases. I spoke to a range of big four tax experts, and this is the feedback that I got, right? And I'm kind of uh, simplifying this uh, here. Uh, many said that this is the last full budget before the election in 2024, so it's possible that the government may want to do something which is meaningful in terms of tax, tax rationalization. It's not an unreasonable kind of expectation. Most agree that rationalization of the holding period threshold will be the first step. Not the tax rate itself, not changes to the tax rate, higher or lower, but the rationalization of the holding period. Like, for example, in the US, across asset classes, it does not matter. The holding period to be able to eligible for long-term capital gains tax is one year. So it's simple, it's flat. Uh, will, could we see something like that? If something were to happen, tax experts agree that that is the place to start. Uh, whether tax rates themselves see uh, changes, I think this is something on which opinion remains very, very divided. As I said, the purpose of this piece is not to say that uh, uh, nothing is going to happen, something may well happen, but uh, I think history shows us over and over again that over-obsessing on this 
uh, is, I think, pretty futile. We will find out on the 1st of February. Back to you guys. Okay. Well, thanks a lot for that. So that's your uh, prep for the day, for the week. But with that, it's enough of work. Now time to enjoy your weekend. Thanks a lot, folks, for joining us on Editor's Roundtable. Have a great one. Do stay tuned into CNBC TV 18 for more news and updates.